My name is Gino da Campo. I'm a chef born and raised in Italy. For Italians, the most important thing in life is food. Let me show you how mouth-watering ingredients have shaped my home country. That's one of the best things that I've ever eaten. Join me tonight in a place obsessed by fruit. Lemon pasta, limoncello, limone. Lemon paradise. I meet the buffaloes that are treated like royalty. Look up behind me. They sunbathing, they eating good grass. And I use some of Italy's best ingredients to create an evening to remember. Salute! Salute! This is my Italian escape. There are so many beautiful places in Italy, but this has to be one of my favorites. With its rugged coastline and stunning scenery, this is the Amalfi Coast. If you look at the boot of Italy, the Amalfi Coast is in the south, near the Ankle. And today, I'm in Amalfi Town itself. Situated at the mouth of a deep ravine, the town has been famous for its fragrant lemons for over a thousand years. In the 1920s and 30s, Amalfi was a stylish holiday destination for film stars and the British upper classes. So why do I love it so much? Well, this is where I used to come on holiday with my family. This place, Amalfi, means a lot to me. A lot of memory when I was a little boy, probably about 10, 11. My mom and dad used to take my sister and I always here to swim and to have ice creams. One thing I loved as a boy was eating ice-cold granita. And here, it has to be flavored with Amalfi's lemons. Ciao, bello. Ciao. How do you make this? Sir? I make it uh, with uh, lemon, sugar, and the water. Lemon, sugar, and water. And the water. That's Organic it. Organic lemon. Mmm. This granita takes me right back to being a boy in the 1980s. It's uh, grated ice, freshly squeezed lemon juice with a uh, um, piece of lemon skin, and sugar. It's so simple, my palate picks up every single ingredient here, and, and magical. That's what it is, magical. Mm. No soup. milk inside, nothing. The tourists like it? Yes. Around 300,000 tourists flock to this pretty coastal town every year. And many of them are British. I love you. <laughs> I love you. I love you more. I love you more. <laughs> the reason why Amalfi is very popular with tourists is very simple. I mean, have a look at the coast. You've got the sea, you've got the mountain, the food is excellent, the people are unbelievably nice. I mean, everybody who comes here is just, just going to get shocked. When I came here as a child, I had no idea that Amalfi's breathtaking scenery was hiding a wonderful secret. Hugging the steep cliffs high above the town are the fragrant citrus groves that make this area unique. Here, the warm Italian sun and cool sea breezes are perfect for growing Amalfi's exclusive lemons. Wherever you go, there is lemon growth everywhere. So this town is lemon crazy. And there is one thing that I want to do here in Amalfi, is to learn everything I should know about lemons. And there is only one way to find Amalfi's lemons, by walking up steps, hundreds of steps. This charming citrus grove is owned and looked after by the Aceto family. Salvador. Hey, Gino. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Everything OK? OK. It's Buongiorno. Okay. Grazie, 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 grazie. This is lemon heaven. Yes. 
Is yeah. it paradise? A paradise? <laughs> yes. It's, it's incredible because as I was walking up, and there are a lot of steps yes, to uh, walk up here. Not too much uh, step. The, the only thing that you can smell is lemons. Yes, it's, it's beautiful. It's phenomenal. I mean, yes. lemon, 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 lemon. Tell me something, why are the Amalfi lemons so special? Is it the best because it never sits inside. Ah, it so is... there is no seeds at all? No, no, no. Oh, look it's at that, so you can actually you can eat peel whole. it yes. and eat it like that. You can eat the skin as well. Because it's natural. We don't use a chemical addition. Mm. This is surprisingly sweet. So you don't use any preservatives, any chemical, anything. Come on, show me how to pick some lemons. I've never done it before. Così, vedi? Oh, ok. Con la foglia. E che succede se rovina da qua? Da qua non va bene perché puoi rompere la corona e si rovina il limone. Ok. See, what you just told me is whenever you pick lemon, you must make sure that you never pick them from when the crown of the lemon is. Because otherwise it will rotten all the way through. So you need to leave a little bit of the green bit on top. Yes. And the characteristic of the Amalfitan lemon is uh, to leave the little leaves on top. You live and learn. <laughs> they should do an aftershave, a lemon it's aftershave. Good for, the for the fly. For, for the, the fly, fly yes. yes. It's good. It's very, very beautiful. <laughs> Salvatore and his family pick 4,000 kilograms of lemons a year from their groves by hand. Many of the lemons are taken to the family's factory, where they are transformed into Amalfi's legendary liqueur, Limoncello. I have been inspired to make a lemon dessert, and I couldn't come to Amalfi without using the local produce. Buongiorno. Ciao, buongiorno. Come va? Bene, Tutto bene? bene? Tutti questi limoni. Guarda quante, quante cose, cose facciamo. Al limone. limone. A limoncello. I've just asked how many things you got with lemon, and she's going through to me the lemons, the limoncello, sapone al limone, lemon soap, lemon pasta, of course, lemon candy, zucchero al limone, sugar lemon. Yes. I never seen this before. Buonissimo. Sugar lemon, miele, lemon honey. This Paralini. is like being in a lemon paradise. But all I need is a bottle of limoncello, and there are so many to choose from. Let's hope this one is the best. Fantastic. Grazie, Bella. Ciao. Grazie, Ciao. grazie, grazie. Ciao. I'm officially all lemoned out. Well, not quite all lemoned out. Salvatore has lent me a corner of his lemon grove so I can prepare a delicious lemon and limoncello mousse. The first thing that we have to do is fresh eggs. We're gonna break them straight into a bowl. I just want to use the egg whites here. It's important to get them all fluffy. Be careful whenever you whisk the egg white because often people turn the whisk into the bowl just like this. And that is a mistake because you don't bring air into the egg white. To make sure that they're fluffy, you have to lift the whisk so then all the air goes into the egg white. That's it, I'm happy. And you know when the egg whites are done, if you can do this. Look, no egg white coming anywhere. This is not a magic trick. They're just perfectly whisked in with some caster sugar. And now for a bit more whisking. What I'm looking for is a light meringue texture. All of a sudden, the egg white is gone light, fluffy and shiny. Okay, I'm happy with this. Now, mascarpone cheese. It's best to loosen up the mascarpone. Now what I'm gonna do, is to grate the skin of an Amalfi lemon. Of course, any old lemon will do the job. The smell is unbelievable. That's it, I'm done with my lemon skin. I got a little bit on the zest here and I'm not gonna let it go because to me, this is like when you have flakes of gold, you don't want to waste them. 
Now, limoncello liqueur. I'm gonna add a few drops into my mascarpone. The lemon zest from uh, Amalfi, the flavor of the limoncello. This is gonna be fantastic. Mix everything together. Straight away, you start to fold in the egg white into the mascarpone mixture. Always little by little. What you want to achieve is something that is creamy, but yet we haven't lost any air from the egg whites. I'm really happy with this. Now, the way I like you to serve it is by using a cocktail glass, because if you have a party, this is gonna look very cool. Look at that creamy mousse. And to finish the dish, crushed hard amaretti biscuits. And that's it, the job is done. Look at that. My lemon and limoncello mousse. And I found a nice little spot over there where I'm gonna eat it. Buonissimo. It doesn't get any better than this. But I've still got more to see and do in the beautiful town of Amalfi. When I came here as a small boy, I loved getting out onto the water in a boat. So I've decided I want to thank the Aceto family, my hosts in the Lemon Grove, with an evening sailing and some superb snacks. Italian entertaining is all about using simple flavors, so I need to find a special ingredient to feed my guests. And I've got just the idea. 60 kilometers south along the Amalfi coast, there is a farm where I'm told they produce the ultimate buffalo mozzarella. In the north of Italy, the weather is not very good, so the buffaloes are not very happy. Here in the south, look up behind me. They sunbathing, they eating good grass. Happy buffaloes means amazing mozzarella. So these fine specimens get the royal treatment, even a personal massage. And it makes all the difference. A cow milk mozzarella is quite tasteless. So usually Italian people will, or myself, I will use it when I bake pasta or when I cook generally. A buffalo milk mozzarella, you shouldn't cook with it. You should just eat it like you would eat an apple. Here at the Vanullo farm, they make and sell 300 kilograms of mozzarella every day. And people will drive miles to get their share. Because as every Italian knows, buffalo mozzarella must be eaten on the day it's made. Nicola Palmieri's family own the farm. And I want to know how they make one of Italy's most popular cheeses. I can already smell the uh, mozzarella everywhere. Yes, yes. This, this one is already? What's happening uh, here? This is a little cherry mozzarella. They are the smallest uh, can I try size, one? so yes, you can try. See, I love mozzarella, so I just can't resist. Mm -hmm. Forgive me. Uh, no problem. Forgive you, me. You can do it. Come on. The curd from the buffalo milk is shredded, heated, and the gooey substance is stirred until the texture is just right. Then it's cooled and the skilled workers break it into the mozzarella balls we know and love. Every ounce of this cheese is precious, so I wonder if they let me get my hands on it. See, I've been in the mozzarella factory before, but there is one thing that I've never done, is actually making mozzarella. Now, now can I do? do? Yeah, you, now you can promise? try. I promise, I promise. Once torn off, the bowl needs to be sealed tightly, so that water can't get inside the mozzarella and spoil it. This is so cool. You must to use these two fingers. So wet the hands, yeah, wet the hands because and then uh, pick it up. Okay, okay. One or two. Okay. And now? And put inside the water. Just leave it like that. Okay. Okay. 
This is not isn't a good. No? This is not good. No. Yeah. This is mine. Uh, the difference. Uh, I, uh, I tend to have. Uh, I tend to go for bigger balls. <laughs> so that's oh, the story of my life. Okay. Do it again. Okay. This is more difficult than I thought. Huh? Oh, good. Good. Oh. I mean, my first monster ever. You, you must not to be empty inside. It isn't closed. Oh, but now you've been a bit too fussy, though. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Hey, hey, give me uh, the chance the to... Uh, yes. <laughs> Ready? Uh, 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 yes or no? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. I think you know what I'm going to do? Uh, I'm going to carry on eating mozzarella yes, yes. instead of making it. Yeah. How about that? Yes. Uh, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you guys. Carry on, I'll put this back. Grazie. Once the mozzarella balls have been, well, properly made by the experts, they are marinated in salted water to give them that special taste. This is the final step to make a good mozzarella. Are they ready to go now? Yes, okay. they're ready. ready to go. People can buy them, people can yes, eat them. Yes. I'm not sure I've done enough work to deserve another treat. Salute but I just can't help myself. See, now it's nice and salty outside, yes. but inside you can still see the tenderness and the milk coming through, the creaminess. It's unbelievable. I'm so excited because I can't wait to taste this mozzarella oh, yes, for you. cooking. This is gonna be fantastic. Okay, mm. let's go. Grazie. Prego, welcome. I've bought some of this amazing mozzarella to make something very special for my sunset cruise with Salvatore and his family from the Lemon Grove. I'm gonna show you a little nibble, which is amazing if you're having a party, your friends around, or you can use for antipasti. And it's mozzarella wrapped with parma ham, served with the pesto and soft cheese and rocket leaves. The first thing we're gonna have to do is to flavor the soft cheese. So what I got here, I got some nice soft cheese that is gonna go straight into a bowl. You can use any kind of soft cheese. Mascarpone will work, uh, ricotta cheese will work, absolutely fine. Pesto and soft cheese go so well together. And now we're gonna add a little bit of black pepper. Okay, so now you can imagine the flavor of pine kernels, the cheese and the basil from the pesto mixing with the soft cheese. Okay, I'm happy with this. Time for the star ingredient. The two mozzarella that I have here is the first one here, the bocconcini, or also known as cherry mozzarella, and the big one here. Look, this is the usual the one you would find in Italy. This, in Italian, is called tizza, which in English translates to a woman breast. For this dish, the little mozzarella works best. Get a few slices of parma ham and lay them on a chopping board. On with the creamy soft cheese and pesto mix. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use some rocket leaves that I'm gonna lay over the parma ham. The peppery and bitter rocket contrasts so well with a mild cheese. Just put half of the mozzarella on one side of the parma ham, just like this, okay? And now simply what you have to do is roll the parma ham with the soft cheese and the rocket leaves, just like this. See, this is exactly what I like about Italian food. You pick up two, three ingredients, fresh rocket leaves, fresh buffalo mozzarella, a bit of parma ham, and the flavors are gonna be just amazing. When I serve these little nibbles later, I know that a limoncello cocktail will go perfectly with them. The first thing you have to do, make sure you got two nice fruit glasses like this, and a fresh lemon. Get your glasses and put them on the top of the lemon. So you make sure that they, you wet the edge of the glass, like this. And then get yourself a little bowl of caster sugar and dip into the caster sugar. Let's see, I'm happy with that. Now for the limoncello. Straight, you probably want about two to three fingers of limoncello. 
going on the bottom of the glass. And straight on top, we're going to go for Prosecco. You can use champagne if you want, but I prefer the Prosecco because the Prosecco has got a little bubbles with the limoncello. It's going to be very good. See? See? Ha-ha! My perfect party food. My time in Amalfi is drawing to a close. But I have got one last appointment to keep. Watching the sun go down at sea with my friends from the Lemon Grove. And the best way to kick off the proceedings? my limoncello cocktail. Let's not drink too much because we are in the middle of the sea after all. <laughs> Salute! Salute! Salute. And finally, an explosion of flavors. Mozzarella di bufala con il pesto, la rucola. È amaro. Però è buono. Amaro è buono perché ha un buon equilibrio. To the Amalfi Lemon, to the Amalfi Coast, and to the Limoncello. Yeah, grazie. E a te, a te, Gino. Grazie. In Italy, we would call today una giornata perfetta. A perfect day. Join me tonight as I get passionate about local produce. It looks like we're going to get married. Yeah, yeah. Look, look. <laughs> I taste Italy's craziest coffees. That makes me smile already. That makes me buzz already. And I hit the spot with my mom's home cooking. Flavor of the garlic, the oregano, absolutely beautiful. This is my Italian escape. If you ask me to name my favorite place in Italy, it has to be Naples. The food, the people, and the scenery are so inspiring. Without a doubt, my heart truly belongs here. This is where I was born, where I grew up when I was a little boy. I studied here to become a chef in the catering college. There's a lot of memories. If you look at the boot of Italy, the province of Naples is on the ankle. Today, I'm starting in the home of my favorite street food, Naples City. Ask any Italian what makes Naples famous, and they will tell you it's pizza. Neapolitans are credited with inventing the margherita pizza. It's said that in 1889, a tomato, mozzarella, and basil pizza was presented here to Queen Margherita of Italy. She loved the colors as they reminded her of the Italian flag, and so the pizza was named in her honor. It's lunchtime, and I've spotted a crowd queuing for a unique Neapolitan pizza that takes me right back to my childhood. It's the ultimate Neapolitan street food, which is a deep-fried pizza with tomato sauce. I know it sounds a bit strange, but believe me, it's sensational. I grew up with it, and I want everybody to see it. The Di Matteo Pizzeria has been deep-frying their traditional pizzas for over 160 years. I want to see how it's made, so I'm meeting the man behind the fryer, award-winning pizza chef, Salvatore. Salvatore. Hey, Gino. Ciao, come va? Tutto a posto. Tutto bene? Everything sì. all right? So, okay. pizza fritta. Pizza fritta. Where pizza do you start? Food. Okay, ricotta. Fresh cheese. Fresh ricotta cheese which is absolutely beautiful in there. So you can understand the freshness that you're going to get from the deep-fried pizza. Poi si mettono i ciccioli. Yep. Cooked pancetta. I can see that this Poi is provo. not going to be very good for my cholesterol, by the way. Then provola, provola. which is the smoked mozzarella. Absolutely beautiful. 
then a little bit of tomato and fresh basil and the job is done. Ora che fai? La copri, la copriamo. Salvatore seals in all that lovely feeling with more pizza dough. La chiudiamo bene perché sennò si apre. Sì. Eccola qua, se no come vuole. There you go. Opa. It looks like a giant pop dough. <laughs> <laughs> My tummy is starting to rumble. It's like being a kid again. Allah, I've never been so excited in my life. Okay. Bravo, maestro, the master. Now we're gonna have to eat. Much love, my I can't wait to get my teeth in here. Mm. Where? Mm. Oh. <laughs> It feels like that it's never been deep fried. So it's, just, it's been baked and the flavor is fresh. And it's unique, it's really unique. It's incredible. It's delicious, but you can't eat deep fried pizza every day. So when I was growing up here, my mom created something special just for me. I used to love pizza, and if it was for me, I would have pizza every day. So what she did, she came up with this dish where it uses the same flavors that you would have on a pizza, but using chicken. And the recipe is called pollo alla pizzaiola. Chicken in breadcrumbs with pizza sauce. And even today, I still make the same dish for my boys. My pizza sauce starts with fried garlic. And of course, I have to have tomatoes. A bit of seasoning. And the herb you get on loads of pizzas, dried oregano. So you mix everything together, like this. Okay, after 10 minutes, it's absolutely done. Now, for the chicken, get a, a breast of chicken, put it on a chopping board, and cover with a little bit of clean film. Next, I get a cooking mallet. You can also use a rolling pin. Very simply, what you want to do, you just want to bash it down until you get about half a centimeter thick breast of chicken. That's it. And the reason why I do that is because you want it to cook it very fast, and if it keeps nice and thin, all the moisture is going to be into the chicken. But before I fry the chicken, I need to coat it in toasted breadcrumbs. So I need some eggs. I like to do the eggs because I remember when I was little, it's the only job in the kitchen my mother would give to me, is whisking the eggs, and that's it. In there, we're gonna pour salt and pepper. I'm seasoning toasted breadcrumbs and flour with Parmesan cheese. Go straight on top. Fantastic. So you get your breast of chicken, it goes into the eggs, okay, just like this. And then straight away from the eggs, onto the breadcrumbs, like this. Put it on top, just press it down. Before you fry the chicken, bash it with the back of a knife. Then it won't curl up in the pan. Straight into the oil. Look at the sizzling. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Beautiful. There is time to make a salad now, but no heavy dressings. Italians like to taste the leaves. A little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil, which is gonna go straight on top, and a nice squeeze of lemon juice. Like this. Okay. I can hear that my chicken is ready to go the other way. Oh, yes. Nice and crispy, fantastic. Coat the leaves using your fingertips, nice and gently. Once you've done that, go straight into a little bowl. Fantastic. Now I'm ready to serve. I can smell that pizza sauce. The flavor of the garlic the oregano, the tomato going through, and it's absolutely beautiful. Then we get the chicken. The chicken is gonna sit on top. 
And the last thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to use a buffalo mozzarella. Two to three slices on top. And this. To finish, a bit more oregano, black pepper, and a little extra virgin olive oil. Beautiful. And this is how you make my mother pollo alla pizzaiola. Neapolitans love to eat, and sometimes they overdo it. So in the evening, they'll find something to settle their stomachs. They have a little drink called cosce aperte, which he translates into legs wide open. But I'm going to explain why. Ciao, caro. È possibile avere un bel cosce aperte? So now I'm going to have this drink, which is simply freshly squeezed lemon juice, then uh, very cold sparkling water, and the last thing that is going to put in is bicarbonate of soda. Pronto? Now is the time where the legs wide open comes into the thing, because you need to have the legs open, otherwise it's going to go everywhere. As soon as you put the bicarbonate in, I have to drink it very quickly. Pronto? Vai. Uno, due, tre, vai. There you go. Ah. Amazing. Now I feel light. Dirty, but light. It's so good to be back in Naples, the area where I was born. One thing I know from growing up here is how seriously we Neapolitans take our coffee. It isn't just a drink, it's a way of life. Anyone who knows me, they know that I love my coffee. But when I say I love my coffee, I'm talking about 10 to 15 coffees per day. Coffee first came to Italy through Venice in the 16th century. However, the people of Naples embraced the drink and moved it forward, claiming to have invented the espresso. In the heart of the city, there is a man who's continuing the Neapolitan obsession with innovation. They call him the professor, and he's taking coffee to a whole new level. Perfect for my first hit of the day. Buongiorno. Gino. Il professore. Come sta? Tutto bene? Tutto bene, abbastanza Fantastico. bene. Fantastico. Ma mi dicono che fate tanti caffè qui. Noi facciamo 63 tipologie diverse 63. di caffè. 63. That makes me smile already. That makes me buzz already. Quindi mi fa vedere due o tre caffè che secondo lei sono quelli lì che vanno di più, diciamo. Certo. Allora, quello che ci ha fatto conoscere in tutto il mondo è il primo che gli presento. È il primo. Esatto. I can see the passion that he has. I love that. I love that and I, I can't wait to taste it. Okay. Quindi, se riesce no, 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 a eh, esatto, esatto. You know, I'm going to try to guess what it is because I don't want to know. I just want to see if my palate will pick it up. You make me nervous. <laughs> okay. Mm. It's go an hazelnut. Ci sono delle noccioline, delle nocciole. Ah, sì, yes. I got, I got yes. that. So a little bit of hazelnut going there. It's like um, hot hazelnut ice cream. È unico. We we'll see about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna nick the recipe. Now, this one looks unusual. Questo lo dovresti un poco mangiare. It's definitely coffee, but really creamy and slightly cheesy. I know exactly what it is. So che cos'è dentro? A ricotta. Esatto. Eh, ricotta cheese. Cheese, cheese coffee. coffee. Yeah. Ricotta cheese. So it's like um, a coffee cheesecake. I am so intrigued. This one comes with special instructions. Ma allora io occhi chiusi, eh? It's frothy, cool and definitely herby. 
anche lì. C'è un retrogusto. Eh. Menta? Ti sei quasi avvicinato. Mi sono quasi avvicinato. Pochino, mint, pochino. acid mint, very aniseed. Anice, è basilico. Eh. Sì? Buono. Basil coffee. Who would have told that? The professor's crazy coffees have attracted stars from all over the world. And I'm keen to know who's been here. Sofia Loren, che è un'attrice internazionale. Yeah. Andrea Bocelli, che nel campo della musica è... Andrea Bocelli, Gino da Campo. Ha avuto Barry White, no? Esatto. Ah, <laughs> I'm so happy to be back in Naples. I love the food and the people here, but there is one obvious landmark that makes my home so unique. You know, a lot of people they do forget that the Vesuvius is a live volcano in the middle of the city. Neapolitan people, they should fear him, but they don't. You know, they, they actually it's the other way around. They respect him and then, and, and I like that. This region has been shaped by eruptions over thousands of years, leaving it with a rich soil that grows the most amazing crops. To find out just how good they are, I'm heading 30 kilometers west of Vesuvius to a restaurant hidden high in a fantastic location. This is the extinct volcanic crater of Fondi di Baia. It last erupted 10,000 years ago and is now fertile farmland. I mean, look at this view. I, mean, I, I really can't believe I'm inside a volcano. And, you know, the first thing that comes into my mind is how peaceful around here is. Stunning, absolutely stunning. At the restaurant today is Chef Tobia and his mama. The kitchen only uses food from the crater and it's all organic. Tobia's son Gianmarco has offered to show me the fields, starting with the basil. You can smell it straight away, the fresh basil. Listen, it's unbelievable. The aniseed of yes, the... Yes, the, the smell of our basil has a different taste, a different smell than that you, what you buy in a supermarket. It's absolutely fantastic. Our ground is rich in minerals, thanks to the Vulcano Blast, more or less 10,000 years ago. The soil, so, nice the and soul, rich. Yes, it's well, I have rich. to say, one I, I'll give you that, the flavor of this basil is really beautiful. This stuff is so good. It makes me want to cook for Gianmarco and his family. I have a dish in mind, but now I need some courgettes. I want this one there. That's the one. And that one there. This one, this one, this one. The one behind. Ah, yes! <laughs> now I got a bouquet of flowers. It looks like we're gonna get married. Ah, yeah. Look, look, <laughs> I'm the bride and uh, you just stay behind me. I've never cooked with ingredients from a volcano before, so I really hope I can make Gianmarco's family proud with a simple Italian peasant dish to show off their vegetables, frittata. Now, a frittata is like an omelette, but bigger, and if you like courgettes, it's one of the best recipe ever because courgettes and frittata, it just work fantastic. A good frittata starts with red onions. And what I want to achieve here, I want to make sure that they get Nice and crispy and caramelized. Now I'm going for color and sweetness with red and yellow peppers. And of course, to make this one even more caramelized, the best thing to do is to put salt straight away. You take away all the moisture from the vegetable and it cooks much quicker. Then I'm gonna add a little bit of black pepper. The job is nearly there. Now, of course, the courgettes. Just slice them in about half centimeter circles. It will do the job. And again, straight in the frying pan. 
give it a good shake like this. Now you can see where my frittata is going, right? While the vegetables fry, I'm going to make a beautiful fresh tomato salsa. I'm just chopping the tomatoes roughly, leaving the skin and seeds in. I remember when I used to cook with my mother, when I used to be a little boy, she always said to me that whenever you cook with tomato, it's a such a beautiful fruit that you don't want to waste anything. And, and, and I think that is very important. Olives work so well with tomatoes. For a little kick, I like a bit of chili. So a couple of pinches will do the job. Salt, very important, because it helps the tomato to kind of marinate. And the essentials in any Italian kitchen. Lemon juice and extra virgin olive oil. Let's not forget those incredible basil leaves. They are going to make this salsa really take off. And just tear them in there like this. Very kind of rough and ready, look. Mix everything together and look at the color. Huh? That's how you make a proper tomato salsa. My fried vegetables are ready. All I need are the eggs. You cannot make a frittata without eggs. In go some lovely golden eggs, beaten and seasoned. The eggs are gonna get all the flavor from the courgettes, the onions and the pepper. And a Gino frittata needs a good Parmesan cheese. And now I'm gonna show you a technique how to turn your frittata around, okay? I get myself a lid, any lid will do, or you can use a flat plate. And this is the technique. First of all, make sure that the frittata is cooked on the bottom. I pour my frittata onto the lid, like this, okay? Then I'm gonna pour the pan on top and that's it. Job done. Tuck in the sides, so make sure that everything is in like there. Oh, the smell is unbelievable. More grated Parmesan cheese, and we are good to go. Let's see, my frittata is beautiful and ready. Oh, come on. Look at the color, eh? The green from the courgettes, the red pepper, the melting Parmesan cheese on top. And there is only one way to serve my frittata, the Gino way. The salsa looks beautiful if you scatter it on the top of the frittata. Perfetto! And I really hope that the guys are gonna like my frittata. Enjoy your meal, guys. Buon appetito! <laughs> Buon appetito! I'm joined at the table by Gianmarco, Tobia and Mamma and I just hope I've done justice to these incredible ingredients. Buono. Tasty. Very summery, the vegetable are nice and al dente. È buonissimo. Buonissimo. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. <laughs> For me, this sums up everything special about the place where I grew up. Good company, great surroundings, and fantastic food. Napoli, ti amo. Naples, I love you. Join me tonight as I get a taste for Italy's essential oil. It's got character, it's got a passion. Uno, due, tre. I just can't believe my eyes. Now this is out of order. This is not a woman, this is a superwoman. And I create a sensational Sunday lunch. This is what a carpaccio is all about. This is my Italian escape. As an Italian, I love to explore my homeland in search of places which I hope will inspire me. So, I'm visiting Puglia, a region where centuries-old tradition meets modern-day Italy.
If you look at the boot of Italy, Puglia forms the hill of the boot. Today, I'm on the Adriatic coast, near the city of Bari. Bari is the bustling capital of the Puglia region and is an industrialized port and university city. Along the coastline is a wide, flat plain, and with the cool sea breezes from the Adriatic, conditions are perfect for growing olives and producing olive oil. They got everything here. They got the sun, they got the wind coming from the sea. Everything is nice and flat. This is paradise as far as olive oil is concerned. There are estimated to be 60 million olive trees in the region, and they thrive on hot summers and cool, but not cold, winters. As a result, Puglia produces 40% of Italy's olive oil. I'm visiting this traditional masseria or farmhouse because I want to take a closer look at the amazing olive trees that produce Italy's most famous oil. For any Italian, especially for a chef like myself, olive oil is the most important ingredient when you create a dish. Especially with a savory dish, you will realize that it always starts with olive oil. This plantation dates back to the Romans, who were the first to commercialize olive oil production. But some of these trees were already growing wild before that time. Corrado Rodio is the seventh generation of his family to look after the 1,000 tree olive grove. He's showing me his most gnarled and characterful specimens. This one, the old boy, is over 3,000 years old. I'm speechless, and that is very rare. This tree has been here before the Roman Empire. Yes. It gives me goosebumps. Yes, yes me too. You know? <laughs> Can I touch it? Yes, yes. Incredible, right? See. It's like touching history. I can't believe that it's still here. Corrado tells me that this tree is protected by a rather clever tracking device. He just told me that there is a metal badge down there which is linked to a satellite dish because they need to make sure that the trees, number one, doesn't get stolen, and most importantly, nobody cuts it down. So this is really protected by the Italian government to make sure that nobody does anything with this tree. Olive trees are one of the oldest types of tree alive today. Their trunk and branches may die off many times, but the tree's roots always remain alive and sprout again, which is why they can form amazing shapes. Look at this tree, natural sculpture. Of what? I like that you find. You want me to guess yes, the sculpture? Yes, yes. Corrado, I can't see anything. Look, there is a, a woman body. I don't know what kind of women you've been out, but I don't see any woman here. Yes, I think it's a woman, no? <laughs> ah, and this is the bum bum. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Corrado, Corrado. You're a typical Italian man. Yes. You see women everywhere. Unlike me, to miss the figure of a woman, I think the sun must be affecting both of us. We need to cool down and sample some of Corrado's extra virgin olive oil made from green olives. Okay. You have to take a little bit and take a... Inside? Uh, yes. Okay. <coughs> it's good. This it's is good. good. Because, it's good because yes. it's got a little bit of peppery yes. in the back of the yes. throat, like a little bit of pepper. Yes. yes. It doesn't feel greasy. This is the reason why our lives, you know, extra virgin olive oil comes from Puglia because he's got character, he's got that passion behind yes. it, and I really like that. Yes. I'm gonna go for a second, cheese. Salute! Oil from green olives has a spicy taste, 
but when the olives mature and turn black, the flavor mellows. This grove has given me an idea for a beautiful recipe using two types of olive oil. My dish is carpaccio of beef with the Italian garnish gremolata. I'm kicking off with some seasoned beef. Whenever you have to fry, whenever you have to sear, whenever you have to cook, what you need is an ordinary olive oil. So get your ordinary olive oil and drizzle all over the beef. It's not worth using extra virgin olive oil for frying, as you lose that fresh olive flavor. I'm covering every side of the beef before searing. Make sure you go yourself a hot frying pan and start to sear the beef all over. You sear the beef about a couple of minutes on each side. This is my version of gremolata, starting with flat leaf parsley and garlic. What makes my recipe different is that I replace lemon zest with capers. Also, my gremolata isn't the standard dry garnish. Mine is wet. The reason why it's a wet gremolata is because I'm gonna add extra virgin olive oil and lemon juice. And of course, always keep an eye on the beef. And this is exactly what you want, look. Nice light brown and carry on with the other side. Now, the only thing that you have to do is to chop away. I could use a blender here, but I don't want a puree. I want my gremolata to have a rough texture. Once you learn how to make gremolata, you will lose it over and over again. Oh yes, I'm happy with the beef. Let it rest for a good three to four minutes and carry on with the gremolata. Now, what we need to add is a good squeeze of lemon juice. The sharp lemon will cut through the rich extra virgin olive oil. And I have to season it. And this is the consistency that you're looking for. So it looks like a roughly chopped pesto. Now's the time to slice the beef. Just like that. Now, can you see? All nice and sealed outside, but yet rare in the middle. This is what a carpaccio is all about. The beef should be thinly sliced. And while it may look very rare to British eyes, trust me, it will melt in your mouth. This is the kind of dish that you would find usually on Italian tables, especially when it's on Sunday. Cover the slices of beef with a wet gremolata, just like this. All I need now are some fresh rocket leaves, dressed, of course, with extra virgin olive oil and lemon juice. And the last ingredient is shaved Parmigiano Reggiano. You can't beat a good Parmesan cheese. Let's see, this looks good. Beef carpaccio with gremolata. Now this is the dish that you should have in Puglia. It couldn't be much easier. A fantastic way to make the flavor of the olive oil sing. I want to discover more about the food of Puglia. So I'm going to an ice cream parlor in Bari Old Town. Ice cream was introduced to Italy in the 17th century. Since then, Italians have built a global reputation for being the best ice cream makers. This parlor produces traditional flavors, but as food innovators, they are also experimenting with savory varieties. Buongiorno. On the menu is a gorgonzola and walnut ice cream. And as a chef, I must try it. Nice, thank you. For you, it's good? I think it's too strange for me, it's too different. Can I try something? Can I try the one with the olio d'oliva, the olive oil one? I prepare for you. 
Italian ice cream has more taste than British ice cream, as it's made with less fat. Come on, Italians are supposed to be masters at this. This looks like a meal. It's not an ice cream, it's a bit of a lunch. Yes. Olive oil ice cream and Parma ham is a surprising combination. You definitely get the flavor of the extra virgin olive oil. I get the little pieces of olives yeah. in there. Slightly sweeter. I like it. Thank you. I Thank think you. it's a good one. See, this is interesting. I like it. But I'm gonna go for a chocolate ice cream. Okay. Thank okay. you. For me, you will never beat a traditional ice cream in a cone. Fantastico. Grazie. Ciao, bello. Ciao. I'm in the region of Puglia, and I've come to the capital, Bari. The oldest part of the city has a maze of medieval narrow streets. And I'm told that what they do in one of them is rather special. I'm searching for women in the middle of the street making handmade pasta. I actually never seen it before, but I know that they are around here. The local women specialize in making their own distinctive pasta, orecchiette, meaning little ears. Bari was once a very poor area, so this regional pasta is made without eggs. Water is simply mixed with glutinous semolina, which bonds the dough together. These ladies certainly make it look easy. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Angela Laspella is happy to show me the traditional method of shaping orecchiette. This is like a machine. It's beautiful the way she does it. I think I'm going to ask her if I can make some. Signora, è possibile fare delle orecchiette? Fare vedere come, come si fanno? Sì. Tieni. Here goes my reputation. Yeah. She said, off you go. Prendi il coltello. Okay. Questo qui? Sì. Eh? Taglia. Gira. Gira. Taglia un pezzetto. Taglia un pezzetto. Vedi? Devi schiacciare e sollevare. Schiacciare. Devi schiacciare e sollevare. E sollevare. Sbagliato. Sbagliato. She said Taglia you need to push and you need to lift. <laughs> wrong. She said the first one wrong. Poi yeah. schiaccia e devi sollevare. Poi schiaccia e devi sollevare. Niente ancora. <laughs> Da quanto tempo che fai le orecchiette? Eh, sette anni. Con mamma che ti mettono insieme. Da quando c'è dire... sette anni? Sette anni. Io ho una da sette. Mamma mia. Mamma mia, they look rubbish. Really, really bad. I wonder if she's going to be politically correct with me. Wait. Eh, cosa ne pensa delle mie orecchiette? Male. Male. Ecco, ma male, male, male. Sono un po' male, però tu hai orecchiette buone. <laughs> This is the most embarrassing thing that I've done in my life. This woman is telling me off that I can't make a particular shape of pasta. She's making this look so easy, but this orecchiette is a nightmare. It's a pure nightmare. I've got a blinding idea which will put Angela's skills to the test. I've just asked her if she can do it blindfolded, and she said yes. I want to see this. Ready? One, two, three. Come on, come on. This is out of order. This is not normal. This is not a woman, this is a superwoman. Bravissima! <laughs> This is incredible. I don't know if I should uh, carry on staying here or leave right now. Angela is not impressed with my efforts, but I want a second opinion. <sighs> Signora, cosa ne pensa? Come sto andando? Abbastanza. Abbastanza bene? Sì. La signora dice abbastanza okay. bene. Lei ha detto male, 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 male. Ma all'inizio. Ma... Ma adesso? See, the lady, she was more politically correct. Yeah, not too bad. Not like this one. No, that was rubbish. <laughs> I want to cook a dish using orecchiette, 
But there is no point using mine. I'll be using the expert variety. It's Angela's pasta with broccoli and fresh tomatoes. The first thing that you have to do is to boil your broccoli. So get your broccoli and they're gonna go straight into boiling water. I'm adding a fair amount of salt for a good reason. This is exactly the same boiling water that we're going to use to cook pasta. Leave it in there to cook for two minutes. In the meantime, what I'm going to show you is how to prepare your garlic. Slice it roughly, just like this. You don't want the slice to be too thin because otherwise they're gonna burn very quickly. Another way to stop garlic burning is to start it off in a cold pan with the olive oil. Time to switch it on. Red chili adds a kick. I've taken out the seeds. Very soon, garlic and chili are gonna start to sizzling the olive oil. The broccoli are ready, and they're gonna go straight into a bowl with very cold water. This stops the broccoli cooking and keeps its vibrant color. I want to cook some sweet cherry tomatoes until they break up. I got my beautiful little ears here, the orecchiette. So straight into the boiling water, just like that. Make sure that you turn the pasta around. And I don't know if you realize, there is one thing that I haven't done, is to add olive oil into the water. That is absolutely useless. You're wasting your money. I'll tell you why, because the oil is gonna sit on top of the water. The pasta stays on the bottom. So what's the point of doing that? To make sure that the pasta doesn't stick, you need to keep the water boiling. Now is the time for the broccoli. Pick them from the water and make sure that you give them a good squeeze. Like that. Then roughly chop. Straight into the sauce. And now it's time to season with plenty of salt. This is the perfect vegetarian dish. It's light, it's healthy, it's colorful. This is Italy. This is what Italy is all about. Make sure that whenever you cook pasta, it's nice and al dente. Drain the pasta and it goes straight into the sauce. All the pasta must be coated with the sauce. And have a look at this. I mean, you already have the colors of Italy in the pan. The white of the pasta, the red of the tomatoes, the green of the broccoli. I'm happy this is ready to be served. Look at that. The best of Puglia in one plate of pasta. Beautiful to look at. Easy to make and full of flavor. A perfect pasta dish. Before I leave Bari, I want to check out the harbor area. The old port is where the hip young locals come out to play. It's eight o'clock in the evening here in Bari, and I'm really curious to find out all these people behind me. You know, the kind of things that they drink, you know, what do they eat? I mean, after all, this is the capital of Puglia. I just don't want to know what's going on. There is a buzzing atmosphere as people relax in the cool of the evening. What's happening here, all these people? All these people come here every day with birra and uh, panzerotto and enjoy the... This is Bari lifestyle. This is very vibrant, yeah, yeah, yeah. very rock and roll. Very rock and roll. Very rock and come roll, on. Yeah. Grazie, grazie. Ciao. 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 To find out more, I get the lowdown from the local barman. I just, I just asked, you know, what's going on here? What are all these people? They say, this is uh, the Italian happy hour, the Barese, the Bari happy hour, where people come here, they have something to drink, and they have these uh, uh, sandwiches with tomato sauce and salami, you know, spicy. He says, the, the spicier they are, the more they drink. Um, and then the panzarotto, the famous panzarotto, which is the deep fried pizza with ham and cheese and mozzarella. Posso venire a bella birra un bel panzarotto? Come no, prego. Eh, va, grazie. Grazie. A voi. Salute. Buona serata. Ciao, bello. Ciao. I think I could get used to the Barese lifestyle. 
This is what I like about Italy. The good weather, fantastic scenery, happy people everywhere, amazing foods, drink. What do you want more from life? My time in Bari is almost over. The region is moving forward and I hope the traditions that make it so special continue to live on. Join me tonight for a roasted Roman treat. I love the sound of the crackling porchetta. I discovered the secrets of the Italian deli. He just told me, if the pig ate well, then you're gonna eat well. And I prepare a very pleasing pasta dish. Right now, I'm the happiest man alive. This is my Italian escape. Rome, the eternal city. Italy's capital is exhilarating, romantic and magical. There is something inspiring here for everyone. And I've come to Rome for my own special reasons. I come here to eat Italian food because I really believe that this is the capital of Italian food. If you look at the boots of Italy, Rome is on the knee. And it was the first place I came to after leaving chef school. Here is where I kind of rediscovered what Italian food is all about. Because, you know, from school, from the catering college, you only get just a little bit of what it's going to be like cooking Italian food. But then when you come to Rome, you understand why Italian food is so beautiful, it's so colorful, it's so rich with flavor, but yet very simple to prepare. Italy's capital has always been home to the rich and powerful. And where you find power, you find the best food. Rome's elite ensured that meat of the highest quality was always on their menu. And for a chef like me, the best place to get that true flavor of the city today is in a specialist Roman deli. Italians with a taste for fine food will always choose to come to a deli over a supermarket. The way they organize the deli is second to none. The variety of the food, the color, the way they display the food, and also the way they interact with customers. You know, they give it to you, they explain it to you, they feed you when you go there, and this is what is inspirational about it. I've decided to cook a typical Roman recipe, pasta carbonara. So I've come to the city's old meatpacking district to find my main ingredient, pancetta, air-dried belly of pork. Claudio Volpetti has been running one of the best delis in the capital for over 40 years, and I'm sure he'll stock the pancetta I need. Buongiorno, buongiorno, buongiorno. Come va? Tutto Come posto? Va? Tutto bene? Che si dice? How are you? How are you? Fantastico. Oh, yeah. Can I have some pancetta, please? Because I'm doing a carbonara. Guanciale. Guanciale? No pancetta. Oh, make a pasta is guanciale. Guanciale is in this part. The cheek oh, yeah. of the pork. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Show you? Yes, please. Oh, yeah? Yes, Thank please. You. He just told me off because I asked for pancetta for my carbonara and pancetta comes from the belly of the pork. And he said, no, 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 no. The best part of the pork to make carbonara is the chick. I didn't know that. See, that's the beautiful thing about Italian that you always learn something new and I like it. Wow. Guanciale is a no sec, no dry. No dry. Okay. No, 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 no. I see. This is very well Can I taste it a little bit? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's ah. nice for make all pasta, yeah. for special pasta carbonara. Car carbonara. Car car but it's nice for eating. Just to eat it. Oh, yeah, 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 because it's a no salami. Sweet. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It's very, very sweet. Oh, yeah. Now we'll try it. Oh, yeah. Let me see. Mmm. It's absolutely delicious. Salty, sweet, and very moist. It's important. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Claudio tells me that during cooking, 
guanciale produces a sweet fat and stays softer than pancetta, which tends to crisp up. And he offers me a chance to sample the pancetta as well. I like this guy. He's feeding me, and that's what I like. This is a pancetta. It's, a, it's very different. This pork is very pork. <laughs> I love when he says, this pork is very pork. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But maybe when is it, when is it, it tastes uh, gorgeous, uh, like uh, delicate salty bacon with a very light texture. And Claudio has an explanation. He said, when you buy pancetta or when you buy guanciale or when you buy parma ham, you shouldn't really ask the question to the person behind the counter. You should ask the pig, what did he eat all his life? because if the pig ate well, then you are gonna eat well. Well, this little piggy has eaten very well. So I'm going to take pancetta and guanciale for my recipe. Eccolo qua. Grazie, Claudio. A good one. Grazie. Grazie. My pleasure. Ciao. What an experience. All I need to go with these wonderful ingredients is a very special location. This has to be the coolest place ever where I've cooked anything. I mean, look at the back. I've got the Colosseum behind me, a beautiful evening, and it's only fair that I'm gonna show you a traditional Roman recipe. So what I'm gonna prepare for you is bucatini alla carbonara. For this pasta dish, the star ingredients are eggs, cheese, and the meat I've just bought. The guanciale looks so tender, it will taste amazing with the pancetta. That's it. Now that I have my meat nice and chopped, let's cook it. Butter will give the meat a lovely, rich flavor when it cooks. And a splash of olive oil stops it from burning. Now is the time that the guanciale and the pancetta go straight in. You can always use streaky bacon here instead. This Roman bucatini pasta is hollow, so it can hold more sauce. So you can imagine if you got a thicker spaghetti with a hole that it goes from one end to the other. But before we cook the pasta, is one thing that is very, very important is the water. What we want, we want boiling hot water and don't be shy with the salt. See? So bucatini goes in there. Onto my fresh carbonara sauce, and I promise you, it's really simple. Two eggs, they're gonna go straight in there. I'm keeping this recipe strictly Roman, with local pecorino cheese. You perhaps are more familiar with Parmigiano-Reggiano Parmesan cheese, which is made with cow milk. Pecorino is made with the milk from the sheep. Carbonara comes from the Italian word for charcoal. Legend has it that this dish was invented by charcoal makers who only had a campfire to cook on and few ingredients. There is no cream in my carbonara. There aren't any mushrooms, there aren't any peas, because I'm showing you a traditional carbonara sauce. To finish, some finely chopped flat leaf parsley. Parsley goes straight into the eggs. See, this is the beautiful thing about Italian food. You can get two, three ingredients, put them together, good quality ingredients, and you're just gonna create a masterpiece. So we go, our pasta ready, nice and al dente, the pancetta and the guanciale hot, and our eggs mixture. Now is the time where you have to be very quick and mix everything together. So get your pasta, like that. We still water coming down, it goes straight into the pancetta. Can you see that sizzling there? I need a little bit of the heat from the pancetta and the oil to completely cook my eggs. So mix everything together. Take the pan away from the heat when you add the eggs in there. Mix everything together for about 10 seconds, very, very quickly. 
The heat from the oil is going to make sure that the eggs, they're going to be cooked. Serve it straight away, straight into your serving plate. Fantastico. And there you have it. Colosseum in the back, Bucatini alla carbonara on my plate. Right now, I'm the happiest man alive. And I'm about to get even happier. Rome, once the hub of a great empire and home to popes and emperors. Historically, its cuisine has embraced a huge variety of tastes and dishes. For a chef, it's incredibly exciting. Every time I come here, I will always find an ingredient that, number one, I've never seen it before, number two, is properly done differently from the other region of Italy. So to me, Rome is just tells me food, 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 and that's the reason why I love it. The ancient Romans feasted on wild boar, and that passion for pork continues today. The town of Ariccia is 30 kilometers from Rome's city center. Romans flock here for one thing, Ariccia's world-famous porchetta, slow-roasted boneless pork that's stuffed with garlic seasoning and wild herbs. And it's on every restaurant menu in this tiny town. Alberto Cavallari has been serving up the town's legendary dish for 50 years. Albert. Ciao Gino, come va? Bene, grazie. Tutto a posto? Tutto a posto, benissimo. Look at my porchetta there. <laughs> it's fantastic. Eh, fantastic. Yeah. And let's hope that the vegetarian fashion doesn't pick up here in uh, Ariccia, because otherwise... Uh, we don't, we don't the, know vegetarian humans. You know, no vegetarians here no in vegetarian Ariccia. Ariccia yeah. <laughs> Why is it so special around here? Because we put in the porchetta some ingredients that are unique, like rosmarino. So rosemary is the main herb. In the country, in the south of Rome, it's typically... So you, so you use typical ingredients yeah. from Rome? Yeah. Enough for the talking. All I can think about is eating this mouth-watering pork. I love the sound of the crackling porchetta. Oh, yeah. I'm going in. I can't, I can't wait anymore. I can't wait. I can assure you, this porchetta tastes even better than it looks. This is the best roast dinner I ever had. The meat is nice and moist. The rosemary, the garlic, the salt and the pepper is coming through amazingly. I'm so impressed. I, I can see it. why the Romans come up here. Oh. Very clever people. Bravo, Albert. For the full porchetta experience, the succulent meat must be eaten in rustic Italian bread. Ciao. Ciao, 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 has been called the queen of Roman cookery. For 40 years, she has been keeping alive a style of cooking that is centuries old. Without her determination, many authentic Roman dishes would probably have disappeared. Buongiorno, Anna. Buongiorno. Ciao, stai cucinando? Eh, sì. Che si mangia? Senti godure. Eh, questo è... Oh. Broccoletti. This is already the best smell you can find in any Italian uh, uh, kitchen. Garlic, oil, and chili. Why just boil broccoli when you can have something so tasty like this? In the UK, we throw the leaves away and we only eat the broccoli. In Italy, it's the other way around. The delicacy is actually the leaf. Quello che ci vuole è il peperoncino e l'olio buono. Beh, non so proprio. It's fresh, fragrant, and with just enough of a kick. 
but it's Anna's classic Roman meat dish of stewed oxtail that caught my attention. Recipes using cheap cuts of meat were popular amongst the working classes in the late 19th century. La cucina romana, questa è una cucina povera anticamente. Adesso si è rivalutata con, diciamo, con l'evoluzione del mangiare. È tutto il gusto. Like any big city, Rome has had many immigrants and they have influenced the cuisine. Luvetta. She said very, very big Jewish community in here. And that's the reason why you have pan kernels, raisins and chocolates, which is very thin. I had no idea that Roman people would use chocolates, especially in a recipe like this one. Anna believes you can't get dishes like this in central Rome because young chefs aren't trained to use traditional ingredients. They are really missing a treat. <laughs> what I like is this interesting chocolate. It just works really, really good, really good. With poor people's cuisine, nothing was wasted. Anna's next dish uses veal sweetbreads, the thymus glands, which many people wouldn't dare try. I need to watch this because this is going to be something new for me. Anna fries the sweetbreads in just olive oil and garlic and throws in meaty porcini mushrooms. Everybody should experience this amazing smell that is going all over this kitchen. It's just incredible. She finishes off the dish with chopped parsley. It's so simple, just a handful of ingredients. Mm. I can only compare the taste to a delicate fried chicken liver. This is um, one of the best things that I've ever eaten. I'm so glad that I found Anna because I was really worried that this kind of recipes here, eventually they will disappear. But now that I found Anna, I know for a fact that they will be here for many years to come. It's magnificent. E queste io me le mangio tutte. Eh, mamma mia, te I am completely blown away by Anna's simple food. So I've decided to create my own Roman dish. So what I'm going to show you now is how to prepare lamb cutlets in honey and rosemary sauce served with a fennel salad. I'm kicking off with a dressing for the fennel salad. It starts with flat leaf parsley and extra virgin olive oil. Then some fresh lemon juice. And squeeze straight over the extra virgin olive oil. And a bit of seasoning. Just whisk everything together. And now to make it lighter, I'm going to add water a little at a time. Now, can you see what's happening there? The dressing is getting very creamy without using any other fats. Nice. In with the parsley and whisk him one more time. I adore that aniseed taste of fennel. I'm not using the outer leaves or the hard hearts. A lot of people throw it away. I like it. Slicing the fennel thinly keeps the salad crispy and light. Make sure that the dressing coats the fennel all over. Before I fry the tender lamb cutlets, I'm going to use the Romans' favorite herb, rosemary. Strip the leaves from the stalk and go straight into the oil. The flavor of the rosemary is releasing into the oil. This is gonna give a fantastic flavor to my lamb. I'm allowing the cutlets just enough time to brown and no more. Crispy outside, nice and tender inside. Now what you have to do is very important whenever you cook meat, that you rest the meat before you serve it. All the lamb needs now is a delicious sauce. I'm gonna use a very 
Roman ingredients, which is honey. Romans absolutely love honey, and I'm going to use that as the prime sauce for my lamb. Just make sure that you mix everything together, because what's going to happen is going to get all beautiful and caramelized. And of course, if you don't want to use lamb, this honey and rosemary sauce will work absolutely fantastic with pork, beef, and believe it or not, grilled vegetable. Mwah. Fantastico. Everything's ready to serve. The fennel salad goes on first, and I hold it all together with that other Roman favorite, sliced pancetta. Next, the lamb cutlets. I make a little wigwam with them. And the last thing we need to do is to drizzle my honey and rosemary sauce on top of the lamb. Look at that. Lamb in rosemary and honey sauce with a fennel salad. Simplicity at its best. It's time to say Arrivederci Roma. Goodbye to Rome. But I'm sure I will always find inspiration in the food and the people of this beautiful city. Join me tonight as I learn how to roll the perfect pasta. First long fusilli. Yeah. I branch out to find fantastic fruits. It's not just a cherry, this is the cherry. And I cook for my Italian family for the first time ever. You know, I don't know why I'm nervous. You know, I've cooked for so many people. This is my Italian escape. It's impossible for me to return to my home country without coming to Campania, the beautiful region where I was born and where my family still call home. Campania is in the south of Italy. Today, I'm going to a town called Gragnano, 30 kilometers south of Naples city. And I'm here for a good reason. As a chef, this is hard for me to admit, but I've never actually cooked for my Italian family before. My auntie Rita lives just down the road, so I've decided to treat her to a meal. That's her, and who's that good-looking little boy? For the meal, I need to pick up some authentic Italian ingredients, and I've come to just the right place. If you ask any Italian, a bagragnano, the first thing that they will say to you is pasta, because Gragnano is the home of pasta. Gragnano has been producing pasta since the Romans were here. These days, the factories in this little town export about 15% of all Italy's pasta. I'm keen to find out how Gragnano's food has become so famous. And the man who can tell me really knows his spaghetti from his linguine. Pasta is in Giuseppe Di Martino's blood. My family has been living here for 100 years and uh, uh, we've been involved in pasta for now three generations, like most of the people from Gragnano. Gragnano was once home to over 150 pasta factories. Each one dried their precious pasta in the streets using the hot southern Italian sunshine. Giuseppe tells me it's not just the sun that makes the town's pasta so special. It's another one of Mother Nature's gifts. This is the Gragnano water. Taste it, see how nice it is. It's light got very little calcium. So it gives you a lighter pasta, not too heavy, yeah, easy and it, and to handle. Very easy to handle, and it doesn't interfere with the taste. 
So Gragnano's blazing sun and delicate mountain water are crucial to producing world-class pasta. But there is one final element high up in the mountains that guarantees pasta perfection. Everywhere around, from each other direction, south, east, north, it's all mountains. So the only way for the wind to get in the town is from west. And west you so have the sea. the sea, and it brings moisture. So the pasta can be dried gradually, naturally, and perfectly. This is the reason why Gragnano is unique. The water, the wind, the perfect position. This town was designed by God to make pasta. Gragnano's unique story has inspired me to cook. And I can't wait to get my hands on this legendary pasta for my Auntie Rita's dish. Buying food in Italy usually means being spoiled for choice. And here, we take our pasta very seriously. This is pasta heaven. Absolutely beautiful. In Italy, there are over 650 shapes of pasta. It's a shame that nowadays they're not widely available. For example, if you take this one, it's like a pot. Right? So I, I, can, I can see this one kind of cooking very slowly in the oven with a nice ragu in the middle, with a nice little bit of beef stock in there, and it's just going to taste amazing. This one here, which is actually called fidanzati. Fidanzati means lovers. And let me explain you why, because can you see? It's like uh, two tubes of pasta kind of making love to each other. That's, that's what it looks like. And what I'm going to do with this is now to prepare a nice tomato sauce with chili, garlic, salmon, and I know for a fact that together it's going to work brilliant. I want to get my pasta dish just right for my Auntie Rita. So I'm heading up into Gragnano's beautiful mountains to perfect my recipe. And here's my dish. Pasta with salmon in arrabbiata sauce. If you want to translate arrabbiata into English, it means upset, when somebody gets really angry. And the reason is, is because in the arrabbiata sauce you have chili, and chili makes the upset thing. The salmon with the arrabbiata, it works perfectly. I'm kicking off my sauce with a splash of olive oil and finely sliced onions. And this is exactly what you want to hear, the sizzling onion into the oil. Now for that angry chili. Okay, not too much because then it's gonna be really arrabbiata and really upset. Now, for the pasta, it's very important to cook the pasta al dente. Any Italian will never eat pasta that is too soggy, okay? And what you have to do is to cook the pasta one minute less than is instructed on the cooking time that is on a packet. Don't tell me off, but salted water makes the pasta taste so much better. A real arrabbiata sauce must have this. Chop tomatoes from a tin. Don't use fresh tomatoes, because, trust me, it's just not Italian. Now, once you put the tomato into the sauce, lower the heat, slowly, slowly. The tomato is getting nice and thick, ready to coat my pasta. For the salmon, what I got here is a nice fillet of salmon. You can get it anywhere. Do make sure that there is no skin on the bottom of the salmon, okay? If you chop the salmon up into small chunks, it will cook much quicker. And you don't have to use salmon. Chicken is just as good. Now, the diced salmon goes straight into the tomato sauce. Italians wouldn't normally cook salmon with arrabbiata sauce. But I think my family need to enjoy the Gino magic in this dish. So what I'm doing now is to gently poach the salmon pieces, releasing the flavor of the salmon into the sauce. And now for the finishing touches. Flat leaf parsley, coarsely chopped. I can't resist more salt, and for even more flavor, a glug of extra virgin olive oil. Gently stir everything together. 
This is actually ready. People often make the mistake that they drain the pasta, they put it on a plate, and then they put the sauce on top. That's not the way to do it. You need to allow the sauce to coat the pasta beautifully. And that's how you get a perfect plate of pasta. So you pick your pasta up, give it a good shake, straight into the tomato sauce. Then, very gently, you mix everything together. The only thing I've got to do now, serve it on a nice warm serving plate. Now, just sprinkle a little bit of parsley on the top. That's it, a little parsley goes on top. Let me tell you, this salmon is very happy to meet my favorite pasta shape. My dish is perfect, but I'm not ready to present it to my Auntie Rita yet. I'm heading back into the center of Gragnano, the home of pasta. It's my first visit here, and so far, I love it. For any Italian, uh, you know, I'll guarantee you, just like me, as soon as you wake up in the morning, you're already thinking, what kind of pasta am I gonna have today? What kind of sauce? What kind of shape? It's so much part of our life that we're thinking about pasta all the time. Before I cook Gragnano's world-famous pasta for my Auntie Rita, I want to see how it's made. So I've come to a place where I've heard that some delightful ladies still finish their pasta in a traditional way. Showing me around this factory is Alberto Zamponi. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Tutto bene? Sì, sì. Have you ever seen? I never before? seen this before, no. What kind of shape is this one? A long fusilli, handmade fusilli. A long handmade fusilli? Yeah. yeah, well, I think I should keep this lady's company. Okay. I feel nervous. Oh, no problem. Stay relaxed. Okay. Okay, like this, and then just roll it. I like this. Più veloce, però. Se no, è quando si fa. She wants me to go quicker. <laughs> I just tried it for the first time. How am I going to go quicker? Ma just che pensate quando fate la pasta? Che pensate? Ai mariti, ai fidanzati. Ai mariti, qua No? I've just I asked, uh, uh, when you do pasta, what do you think? Your husband, your boyfriend, he said, my woman, we don't think about men, we just make pasta. <laughs> See, if I was working right. here, All right. I will do probably one kilo per day. <laughs> I don't know. That's okay. All right, your first fusilli. My first long fusilli. Yeah. Come on. This way of shaping pasta is hundreds of years old. Apparently, the dough used to be rolled around umbrella spokes. E questo vuole imitare i capelli di una Madonna del Carmine. She said that it resembles the 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 hair of a Madonna, not the singer, uh, uh, Jesus' mom. That's the one. The hand rolled fusilli is slightly thicker at each end compared to machine-made pasta. When cooked, the ends stay harder meaning the pasta is less likely to break. Alberto, I'm wondering why there is only women do this pasta? Where, where are the men here? Because the women are more gentle to, 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 to move fast, to take pasta, and then because they, they, has, they haven't so... They don't have hair? No. <laughs> no, no, of course. You never met my mother, have you? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Please, don't say so. Now I have seen the dedication of these lovely ladies, I can understand why Gragnano's pasta is so special. But I'm told that there is another local product that should be just as well known. Four hundred meters above sea level, and facing the sleeping volcano Vesuvius is a hidden surprise. The most incredible cherries 
I've ever seen. I have to admit, I've never been into a cherry orchard. And the only thing that comes into my mind is definitely, I think this is one of my favorite trees ever. I'm looking for the owner, Ciro Scala. This beautiful orchard has been the pride of his family for more than 100 years. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Ciro. Ciro. Come Ciro. state? Tutto a posto. Tutto bene? Sì, sì, tutto bene. Fantastico. Bellissimo eh. qua, eh? Eh, sì. Eh. Me ne fa assaggiare? Posso prenderne qualcuno? Prego, pure, pure accomodarsi. I prego. need to try one. I need to try one. Com'è? Buona? È buona. È buona. È dolce. You know, this is, uh, is what a cherry should taste like. It's sweet, but mainly is the color. It's like a cherry that is being designed by Gianni Versace. It's not just a cherry. This is the cherry. I'm dying to know how Ciro has managed to grow fruit with such a fantastic taste. Mille anni fa, eruttando il vulcano, ha portato della rapilla e quindi le piante diventano belle, fanno il frutto buono e tutto viene come la natura crea, praticamente. Seeing all these succulent cherries just makes me want to create something with them. Io vado, eh? Gino, puoi salire, vado. io la tengo. I have to say, I don't have the best shoe for uh, 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 cherry picking, but hey, hey, we are in Italy, so... Uh... Io vado, eh? Wow. This is pretty hard work, but that's not a bad view from the office window. Signor Ciro, come sto andando? Un po', un po' qualche rametto in più, però... Ah, just asking how I'm doing, and it doesn't sound very enthusiastic. He said, you're picking more leaves than cherries. But I think I've got enough cherries now for a special dessert. And I have a great recipe in mind where I can use them. Ecco qua. C'ho le ciliegine. I know you will love this dish. Veramente la ringrazio. It's delicious, quick, and I promise you, very easy. It's cherry tiramisu. Everybody loves a tiramisu, but not everybody loves coffee. So I thought, why don't I use fresh fruits? I'm gonna put a little bit of cherry liqueur, a sponge, and I know that it's gonna be just fantastic. Make sure that your frying pan is hot, so the cherries go straight into the frying pan. In case you're wondering, I've taken the stones out. I'm gonna add a little bit of sugar so they get beautiful and caramelized. And then I'm gonna add cherry liqueur. The cherries need to go a bit soft until the skins split a little. Very nice. I'm just going to put them on the side here and leave them to cool down. Now, for my gorgeous tiramisu cream, which starts with caster sugar and egg yolks. And have a look what's going to happen now. The more you whisk, and the paler the color of the egg yolk is going to become. And you need to achieve that color, because that means that the sugar is completely melted into the egg yolk. That's it, I'm happy. It's gone nice and pale. You can't have a tiramisu without mascarpone cheese, but do soften it first. For a final burst of flavor, scoop out a fresh vanilla pod. That is like, it's like finding gold. It's, the smell is unbelievable. So get your vanilla seeds straight into the mascarpone cream. Uh -huh. Mix everything together. And the last thing that we're gonna add is a little touch of cherry liqueur. Oh. 
Oh, I wish you could smell. That's it. Job done. Now it's time to build my tiramisu, starting with sliced sponge cake. Just gently press it down with your fingerprints. Then the luscious cherry cooking juices, followed by that glossy vanilla cream. Then we're gonna add three to four cherries and carry on until the glass is full. And the last ingredient that I'm gonna put on top is crushed hazelnuts. There you have it. Look at that. It's just buonissimo. My time in Gragnano is drawing to a close, but I've got one last very important thing to do. I've come to see my Auntie Rita, and I'm going to cook my salmon pasta dish for my Italian family. I have to admit, I'm a little bit nervous because uh, uh, I know that it sounds quite strange, but I've never cooked for my family before. And, you know, whenever I come here, they always cook for me. You know, I don't know why I'm nervous. You know, I've cooked for so many people. They shouldn't make me nervous. I'll be okay. It's fine. It's fine. Already at the table is my Auntie Rita and all my uncles and cousins. But what makes me really worry is that Italians are the toughest food critics in the world. Wish me luck. Pasta alla rabbiata con il salmone. Questa è una ricetta uh, uh, adattata. Eh, Mista, eh, ma... Mistra, sì. Napoletana di due. Eh, sì, sì. Eh. Aspetta, do... So far, so good. But I need to ask the best cook here, my Auntie Rita, what she thinks. Sì, è buona? Fantastico, guarda. Wow. Eh! eh. Salute! It's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. I love it when amazing food brings amazing people together. Buon appetito! Join me tonight as I explore two of the most extraordinary towns in southern Italy. It's weird to me. I use my loaf to make traditional bread. Don't adjust them, they were perfect. <laughs> and I get excited by authentic recipes. Leave it rustic, leave it rustic. This is my Italian escape. I love visiting places in Italy, which are unusual, intriguing, and still relatively untouched by holidaymakers. So I have come to Puglia, a traditionally poor region with unique character. If you look at the boot of Italy, Puglia forms the hill of the boot. Today, I'm starting off in the west of the region, in the town of Altamura. For 2,000 years, bread making here has flourished in dozens of small bakeries. Altamura is world famous for its rustic bread. The loaves have a very thick crust, which gives them a two-week shelf life. For peasants and shepherds in the fields, this was their staple diet. And for modern-day Italians, bread is still everything. Very rarely you will see an Italian family sitting down at the table eating without any bread. I mean, as far as I can remember from when I was a little boy, we always had bread on the table. The essential crop needed to make Altamura's legendary bread 
is Durham Wheat, and field upon field of it surrounds the town. Puglia's climate and flat landscape are perfect for growing the wheat. I've come to meet a man whose family holds the secrets to the town's outstanding reputation for making Italy's prized loaves. Giuseppe Di Gesù and his family have been making and selling bread in this bakery since 1850. They bake the bread in a brick oven that burns oak wood. The loaves have the aroma of toasted coffee and a mild taste of vanilla. But the guys here don't just bake their own bread. The community are in on the act as well. Local lady Emilia knows what makes a good loaf. Buongiorno. Buongiorno, buongiorno. Portate il pane. Ah, benissimo. 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 OK. They, uh, she makes this bread at yeah. home, and I make it into, the, into my home. Why do you do that? Uh, because it's an old tradition. Well, she doesn't trust your bread. She yeah. makes her own bread. Uh, yes. <laughs> you must be very popular with the old ladies well, around here. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and after, because this is airs. So you stamp the bread. OK. So each lady has their own uh, uh, stamp. Oh, yes. Oh, that's, that's, that's very cool. <laughs> very cool. cool. Many of Altamura's women use Giuseppe's oven. This tradition dates back to when home baking was taxed. The government tried to stop people making too much bread and wasting wheat. As a result, women used the oven belonging to the local baker, and he controlled how much bread they made. The team are loading the oven for the next batch of bread, and I am desperate to get my hands dirty and make the local loaf before the oven door closes. Let's bake some bread. You can do like me. One, One. so, so, and okay. after so, with an... Wait, 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 you're going yes, too fast. Yes, so, yeah. and after with an, you can... Ah, okay. So this, okay. Beautiful. Yeah, yes, yes, slowly, slowly. Yeah. Okay, so now you need to fold it this way. Okay, and like after, this. yes. And now? And now I help you. Yeah. And after, so. Ah, like this. Yes. yes. Okay. Beautiful. That's all right. Bravissimo. <laughs> That's it? Okay. <laughs> Don't adjust them. They were perfect. <laughs> This job seems to me a very hard job. I mean, you come here very early in the morning, it's very hot. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the smile going? Hey, I have the smile because this is our tradition. This is the tradition of my family. These okay. are ready. The 300 loaves can now be cooked, including Emilia's personalized bread. Now we close the oven. The oven is sealed tight, wet cloth is used to make the seal, and the bread inside is cooked at about 400 degrees centigrade. Okay. <laughs> Unlike normal bread, made with fine, soft flour, this dough is made with coarse flour from hard Durham wheat, called semolina. Giuseppe tells me why the semolina is so special. È un terreno particolare, ricco di ferro, di sole, di calcio, di tutti quegli ingredienti che lo rendono speciale. So you just tell me that uh, the reason why the wheat in Altamura is so special is because the ground is full of iron, calcium, plenty of sunshine, and so th th that's the reason why they have the best semolina around. So Altamura's sun-hardened wheat creates its fantastic semolina. Combine this with centuries-old traditional methods, and you have the priced bread. After an hour, the 300 loaves need to be unloaded. The smell, eh? The smell is very natural. There is no time to get chefy. We need to get the bread out, including mine. Gino, this is yours and this is mine. But my one looks much better. Oh, yes. Much better, because it's, uh, it's got a more it's of a rustic shape. Much Carry on better. before we okay. burn everything. <laughs> It is rustic bread, after all. Lord, uh, this is 300 pieces of bread is going to take an hour here. One hour, yes. Really? Yeah. See, that is... 
Andiamo. Via! 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 Well, I can't stand in front of this oven for an hour. I just have to get stuck in. Bravo, Gino! Don't worry, leave it to me. You know what I like? That each piece of bread is completely different from another. Via! Vieni. Ecco fatto. Bravo! Dove lo mettiamo? Qua, qua, vai, in fila, vai, in guarda, fila. Guarda. Aspetta, aiuto io, ti aiuto io. No, 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 ah, in fila. Sicuro? Ah! Oh. Attenzione che scotta, eh! Oh, you got gloves, I got bare hands! Pay attention! I guess there is no time for any sympathy, then. This is Emilia's brand. Ah, this is the one with the oh, deep lead. It's... Oh, there you go. I hope she's gonna be happy. Okay? That looks quite cool. With the oven empty, I want to discover how wheat has played its part in the area's cuisine. So I'm heading 20 kilometers through the golden fields to a place called Matera in the region of Basilicata. The old town here is amongst the most ancient in the world. And to me, it looks like a giant nativity scene. The natural caves in Matera's deep ravine were adapted to become homes thousands of years ago. But in the 19th century, a rapid population growth meant tightly packed in sanitary cave homes. By the 1950s, disease was rife and the town's 15,000 inhabitants were evicted by the government, leaving a kind of ghost town. More than 50 years later, some people are starting to move back. Hidden away in the maze of streets, I've discovered a restaurant. I want to find out how this extreme hardship affected the local food. What we got here? This is called zuppa di grano e ceci, which means soup of wheat and chickpeas. And that's it. There is nothing more. Nothing. Broth and tomatoes. What is it there? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, some uh, tomatoes and broth. But the concept of the food in this region is uh, poor people cuisine, cucina povera. It's made by ingredients coming from the poor people fields, so they didn't buy anything. Whatever they had in the land, they will put on the dish. Put on the dish. Hmm. Very simple, but very clean with flavor. I never had this before. Oh. Never tried it. So you just uh, like get the taste of basilicata. And also the um, taste of wheat, which for us is very important food, the basic food of our meals. Uh, I also try another regional dish called chaledda, made with eggs and vegetables. So this is a great vegetarian dish. Yes, vegetables is another a food of uh, the Basilicata region. Bono, bono, bono. Now I have sampled the cuisine, I want to cook in the style of the region. So I've created a simple treat, which uses Giuseppe's bread and the minimum of ingredients. It's my version of baked beans on toast, cannellini beans on bruschetta. It's not bruschetta, but it's bruschetta, the sk, bruschetta. What it means in Italian is toasted bread with anything you want on top. I'm coating both sides of the bread with olive oil and salt. Now, what you have to do is to put the bread on a very hot griddle pan. If you don't have a griddle pan, you can always do the bread under a very hot grill. And now for the fried topping, starting with beautiful red onions. And this is exactly what you should hear, the sizzling of the onions into the oil. Of course, always keep an eye on your bread. This dish wouldn't be the same without delicious cherry tomatoes. I'll leave the skin on, I'll leave the seeds on, just cut them in quarter, put them in the middle of your hands, and just squeeze them. So all the juices, they're gonna be released with the onion. That's it. The only thing you have to do, mix everything together and let it cook for an extra minute. I'm happy with my breads. Ah, oh, have a look at this. 
This is exactly what I want. Golden breads with the oil and salt all over, beautifully toasted. Just let it rest, because as the bread is resting, the crust is gonna be even harder, but inside, nice and soft. And now I'm gonna add chopped flat leaf parsley. And when I say chopped, I don't mean finely chopped. I want your parsley to be nice and rough, just like this, look. Leave it rustic, leave it rustic. Okay, give it a good shake. And now the cannellini beans. I'll make sure you drain them from their water. Mix everything together and sprinkle over loads of black pepper. Now, have a look at this, all this bubbling. This is the juices from the tomatoes and the beans releasing. And I want you to leave it like that for one minute. My bread is cold, so to turn it into that authentic bruschetta, it needs to be rubbed with garlic on both sides. Look at this glistening bean and tomato mixture. Buonissimo. It will taste so amazing with my garlic bread. Oh yes, extra virgin olive oil to finish. You may call it this beans on toast, I'll call it bruschetta with cannellini beans. These beans really beat those baked ones. Simple, quick to make, and delicious. I've come to Puglia, a beautiful yet poor part of southern Italy. I couldn't visit the region without a trip to the rather bizarre looking town of Albero Bello. These cute little local houses are called Trulli and they have intrigued me ever since I first came here on holiday. I remember when I was a little boy, I must have been probably about five or six, and the first time I saw the Trulli house, I thought that the Smurfs lived here. Of course they don't, but with its fairy tale atmosphere, Albero Bello is a real draw for tourists. There are places where it's full of tourists, you know, shops, bars, you know, tourists, they're going up and down. And then there are places where it's very quiet, where people actually live in the Trulli. And it's, it's weird to me. Trulli were generally built as either storehouses or homes for agricultural workers. I want to take a closer look at these unusual buildings and tourist guide Katia De Carlo is going to show me around. Wow, the view is incredible from here. That's one of the best view of Alvaro Bello. Any reason why the roof is like a cone shape? Because cement, starting from the 15th century, was forbidden. So all these trulies here, they're actually holding without any cement whatsoever. Today, you can find cement, but at the beginning, trulli houses were built without cement. The original trulli were built with limestone from local fields, and people used dry stone techniques. They could avoid paying taxes by dismantling the buildings. None of these quaint houses are exactly the same. While the outside of the Trulli are intriguing, I've always wanted to see inside. Wow, this is very nice. You know, I was expecting the ceiling to be a cone shape. Why, why is flat on top? It's over this roof. You see the opening? It was a storage. A storage to store food. And the smoke of the fireplace went up to smoke the food and to keep it longer. All the truly are modern like this inside? That's not all the truly houses are modern. This has been turned into a vacation home. This house feels surprisingly big. There are two bedrooms, and this one was for the children. How many children they used to have? Ten children per family. Very fertile, uh, truly. And I love the uh, wooden beams here. Very rock and roll, I have to say. No, but in the past, they were used to cover the roof with other wooden beams. Okay. And imagine that children went to sleep in the roof. So okay. children slept 
at the bottom here yeah. and on the top. It's been fun to explore the houses which fascinated me as a boy. But there is something that this chef has got to do in Albero Bello. Cook above the rooftops. I have the truly behind me, fantastic ingredients on my table. So I've decided to prepare pagnotta imbottita, which is bread stuffed with salame, cheeses and vegetables. Off comes the top of my rustic loaf. Once you take the top of the bread off, get yourself a tablespoon and take all the center of the bread out. Of course, don't throw the dough away because what you can do with this one, you can make toasted bread crumb, meatballs or meatloaf. The first ingredients that we're gonna put in there is cheese. I'm using a local cheese that is called cacio cavallo. Lay the bottom of the bread and it's very important to put the cheese first because when you're gonna pour the other vegetable in there, they're gonna have oil in it and the cheese is gonna stop the oil oozing out of the bread. If you don't have cacio cavallo, a strong, firm cheddar will do the trick. Now, as soon after the cheese, we're gonna put the salame. And when you put the salame, make sure that you cover the sides of the bread. Parma ham or bresaola will also go really nicely with the cheese. After the salame, crochets. I'm using here grilled crochets. They go in all over the side of the bread and make sure when you put the ingredients in that you press it down with your fingertips so everything gets very nice and tight. Now for a classic Puglian ingredient. These are sun dried tomato in oil and they're absolutely delicious because they're nice and sweet. They've got all the herbs with it and I'm also relying on the flavor of the oil. Press them on top of the courgettes. On top of the sun dried tomatoes, I'm gonna pour my roasted peppers. Don't panic, you can use the one in the jar. And it doesn't really matter what color peppers are, yellow, green, red, it's absolutely fun. Now, give it a good sprinkle of black pepper. And the last layer we're gonna do is to pour cheese on top. It's gonna help for you to press everything down and there is no oil that is gonna go everywhere. How easy is this? I'm happy with this. Make sure you cover with the top of the bread. And then you're just gonna have to put a little bit of pressure on top. See, the job is done. Now let me show you exactly what you're gonna get in the middle of my stuffed pagnotta. There you go, my pagnotta imbottita. Stuffed bread with salame, cheeses and vegetables. My favorite food on the go. This is the tastiest sandwich ever. A beautiful mix of colors and flavors. Before I leave Albero Bello, there is just time to catch the town's procession dedicated to Sant'Antonio, the saint of lost people. Albero Bello hasn't forgotten its traditions and I'm pleased that the town I loved as a boy is thriving while respecting its humble past.